to my friend and brother, Pastor John McVicker, Sister McVicker, and all of you that make up Christ the King, and any guests who may be with us today, I am delighted to have the privilege of worshiping with you another time, celebrating with you this uh, founder's recognition uh, and the wondrous leadership that God uh, shares with you through Pastor John McVicker. Would you give God praise for him today? Bless you, Pastor. He is a brother beloved, and I count it a privilege to call him friend. I appreciate both his and your hospitality today and uh, celebrate with you the wonderful things that God is doing at Christ the King and through this great leader. Would you join me in the book of Isaiah today, the 41st chapter of the book of Isaiah. From Isaiah 41, verse number 10. Verse number 10 of Isaiah 41. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Amen? Amen. Isaiah 41, verse 10. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. I want to use as our thought for this worship, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I read not long ago that God and Satan take differing approaches to fear. It is, in fact, an observation from Martin Luther many years ago. He said, first, God allows us to fear that he might comfort us later. On the other hand, he says, Satan encourages us to be prideful that he might terrify us later. Two differing approaches to the subject and to the reality and experience of fear. The Bible says that there are two kinds of fears. The first kind of fear that the Bible refers to is the fear of the Lord. It is to have awe and respect and reverence for God. It is to reverence his power, his might, his majesty. It is to respect his wrath. The fear of the Lord is a total acknowledgement of who God is and what God can do and therefore always keeps God in his proper place. The Bible goes on to say that those who fear the Lord are blessed. Psalm 111 verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 1 verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 19 verse 23, the fear of the Lord leads to life. So those, so those who live with this fear of the Lord are those who are blessed of God. But the Bible says there is a second kind of fear, and that fear is the spirit of fear. The spirit of fear will paralyze you, and ultimately it will defeat you. And the reason the spirit of fear paralyzes and defeats us is because it ascribes more credibility to people and to circumstances than it does to God. And whenever I give more credibility to everything else other than God, it is a reflection of the fact that I am having a difficult time trusting God if I fear something else more than I fear God. We do, though, as Christians, have a great benefit. Our benefit as believers is that God knows that we are imperfect in our faith. 
And because God knows we are imperfect in our faith, God has liberally sprinkled the words of encouragement in the Bible to help us understand that we need not fear the things of the world. God knows we fear people. He knows we fear circumstances. God knows we fear the future. But Matthew 10 and verse 31 is a great reminder to us because Jesus says, don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. The implication is God loves every creation he has made. He loves even the sparrows and watches over them. But God, in fact, has the hairs on our head numbered and cares more for us even in a greater way because we are of more value to God than even the sparrows. In this text verse in Isaiah 41, Isaiah is seeking to offer encouragement to the people of Israel understanding that both, both of the kingdoms of, of Israel, because this is after the division, Isaiah understood that the northern kingdom was already in captivity and that the southern kingdom faced captivity. So on the one hand, Israel was dealing with the problem. On the other hand, Judah was about to face a problem. And Isaiah's message to both of the kingdoms was, do not fear. Do not fear, even though we are facing national problems. Do not fear, even though we are facing political corruption. Do not fear, even though on the one hand, half of us are exiled, and the other, on the other hand, the other half are about to be exiled. Why should we not fear, even though we look around us and see all of these terrible things happening? Isaiah's point is, don't fear, because... God is still our God. That's the reason not to fear. Things may be in turmoil. You may be frustrated. You may be confused. But hold on to the fact that even though you are confused and frustrated, that God sees from a different perspective, meaning he looks at time from a perch in eternity, and because he sees as we do not see and has fully pledged his co and committed himself to us, then we have no need to fear. The question is, does what Isaiah say apply to us? And the answer is yes, because Paul says in Galatians 3 and verse 7 that those who have faith are children of Abraham. So the promises that God made to Abraham in terms of him being our God and us being his people still apply to us because we hold the faith that Abraham held and because we hold Abraham's faith, we are children of Abraham able to apply and enjoy the promises God made to Abraham in our own time and in our own lives. I want to suggest today that there are three reasons in this verse, Isaiah 41 and verse 10, that we, can, that we can overcome our tendency, our proneness, our proclivity to be fearful. Those three reasons are we have the presence of God, we have a relationship with God, and we have the promises of God. All in Isaiah 41, verse number 10. And if you don't mind, keep your Bibles open to Isaiah 41. I want to reference the verse again and again. Verse, 40, verse 10 of Isaiah 41 begins, So do not fear, for I am with you. Let's stop right there. The first reason not to fear is because God says, I am with you. So the presence of God should prevent us from being fearful. But understand when you look at that verse, after that comma that follows the word fear, it says, for I am with you. Now that I am does not merely represent an identification of who that person is that's with Israel. It's about more than who the person is. 
I am refers to the nature of the person and the character of the person. Matter of fact, if you go back to Exodus 3, verses 14 and 15, when Moses says, who should I say sent me to Pharaoh God when he asks me who sent me? God said, tell Pharaoh I am that I am has sent you. So I want you to see that in this text today because Isaiah says, so do not fear for I am with you. If I can state it better, what God is saying, do not fear because I am is with you. Because whenever you say, listen, when God said I am to Moses in Exodus 3, that, that verb, uh, that, that name or that phrase I am is rooted in the verb to be. Which means that God was saying to Moses, tell Pharaoh that be is with you. you. Think about what I'm saying. Because I'm saying that there is no tense with God. We say was, is, will be. God merely says is. So if I can say it another way, God was saying is, is with you. What do you mean, God? Well, whatever you need me to be, I is. I be, I be that. I, uh, uh, it's like, uh, oh my God, it's like, it's like in Atlanta, I can leave home and I can be heading down, uh, I can be on 75 North, headed into Atlanta, and I pass on my right hand at this street called Cleveland Avenue, I pass a Kmart, and then a little bit further down on my right, I pass the stadium, uh, turn a field where the Braves play, and a little bit further down on my left, I pass um, the capital, the state capital of Georgia. Uh, but I don't pass them all at once. I pass them sequentially, meaning there's time and distance between them. Uh, so I don't see them all at the same time. But if I was in a helicopter above I-75, I would see Kmart, the stadium, and the capital all at the same time. So when God says, I am is with you, he's saying the one who can sit above everything, whether it's your yesterdays, todays, or tomorrows, see them all at the same time. So you don't have to fear, because even though you got to wait till tomorrow to see tomorrow, I see it all right now. Even though you sing, I'll understand it better by and by. I sing, I understand it all right now. So don't fear, because I am is with you. Well, he speaks without tense. There are no limits on God. David says in Psalm 23, yeah, I got to go through some tough stuff. But yes, even though I walk. Through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil for thou art, I am is with you. So a child would say to his parent or to her parent, Mama, where did God come from? Who made God? Because the child scientifically assumes that since everything has a cause, that something caused God as well. But the name for God, which is Yahweh, related to the phrase I am, refers to a being without a beginning, which means that God is self-existent, that he does not have to depend on anyone else to be who he is because there is no cause for God. There always was God, which means no one ever caused him. He has not been caused, but he is the first cause which means that he's able, like it says in Isaiah, to renew us, but never has a need to be renewed himself. I am is with you. What does that mean? That means if you fill your car up with gas tomorrow morning and then drive around Milwaukee all day, by the end of the day, you have depleted your gas. You may be at a half a tank or even a quarter of a tank. But God, who is full even from the beginning, can drive around all day, answer every one of our prayers, and by the end of the day, his tank still says full because I am is who he is. I 
I am is with us. And he knows. He knows fear paralyzes us. And he knows that when we are fearful and we are paralyzed that we make no progress. But he also understands that fear keeps us from trusting God. And that's what leads ultimately to our disappointment. And so over and over again, he tells his people in the Bible not to fear. Genesis 15 verse 1, he told Abraham not to fear. Genesis 26 verse 4, he told Isaac not to fear. Exodus 14 and 13, he told Israel not to fear. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 8, he told Joshua not to fear. He says, don't fear because I'm with you. And when you jump to Genesis 39 and wonder how Joseph was a able to go through everything he went through and still end up being second in command in Egypt, it's because Genesis 39 verses 2 and 21 says, despite what he went through, the Lord was with him. He says, don't fear because I am with you. All right, so that's the first, I'm not going to keep you all on today, but that's the first reason that you ought not fear. You're not alone. And the one who is with you is the one who sees the end from the beginning. The second reason not to fear is because we have, we have a relationship with God. Isaiah 41 verse 10, so do not fear for I'm with you. Presence, do not be dismayed for I am your God. The second reason not to fear is because we have a relationship. He says, don't be dismayed, I'm your God. Now, the important thing to understand about the Hebrew there is that word dismayed in the Hebrew has to do with looking around for where your help is coming from. Meaning that you are living your life in such fear, in such apprehension, and in such anxiety that you are looking each and every way around you to see where your help is coming from. You are gazing for help. But it's not, it does not have to be that way for believers. That's why the author of Hebrews says in chapter 12, verse 2, to focus our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. So we don't have to gaze about looking for help because we've got a resource that distinguishes us from everyone else. There is no greater resource than the God we serve and the Christ who has redeemed us. Why no greater resource? Because of the personal commitment that he's made to us. So he does say don't fear because of my presence, but he adds don't fear because of our relationship because there is a difference between presence and relationship. You can be close to me, but still not be worth anything to me. You see what I'm saying? You can have someone beside you, but no, it's not going to make any difference whether they're beside you or they leave you. There are some people who are not worth anything to you in terms of what you have to face in your life. And so God does not merely say, I'm present. He says, I'm your God which means that all of his resources are at the disposal of those he claims as his own. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's not just the presence that matters, it's the relationship that matters. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 10, when you pray, say, Our Father. That's important because if I'm praying, but we don't really have a relationship, then there are certain things that I cannot count on from God when I call him. You see, what I'm saying is you got a whole lot of people calling God's name every day. But they have not yet embraced his offer of salvation to them. And so they may experience common grace. Because all of us get some rain and sunshine, saved and unsaved. But there are specific kinds of graces that are only available to those who have acknowledged the Son because the Son said nobody comes to the Father except by me. So proximity is no guarantee that you're going to get the blessing. Just because God is near doesn't mean the blessing is coming. The question is, is he your God? Because you can, you can have him in the neighborhood and still be unprotected. Relationships are important. Our relationship with him obviously is absolutely important because any sociologist will tell you that if you live your life completely in isolation, you will have 
worse health problems, you will die earlier, you will have physical and emotional difficulties by living in isolation. So the one thing we need to know, especially in a world like of ours where people can withdraw from you, is that there is at least one somebody whose resources are greater than anyone else and who has committed himself to us. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, all you got is God. But I need you to know, and I, you know, it's good to have people sitting around you that you can fellowship with. But if you don't have them, if you've got God, he will wake you in the morning with encouragement. He will sustain you throughout the day. And he will lay you down at night, tuck you in, watch over you all night long, and awaken you to a brand new day. If all you got is God, I want you to know you got plenty. The believer has an assurance that we are connected to God, which means we've got access to who God is and what God can do. And that ought to diminish our fears. This relationship is absolutely important. When I was growing up, I can remember being disciplined by my parents, whether it was verbal or corporal punishment, spanking. I, I got those. So they would discipline me. My mother would spank me, but then an hour or so later, she'd call me to the table for dinner. Now, y'all understand what I'm saying? The punishment did not preclude her from providing what I needed. My daddy would punish me, but he kept a roof over my head. He kept, he kept bread on my table, and he nurtured me along with my mother. What I'm trying to say to you is the relationship with God is important. Now, why do my parents punish me and then provide for me? They did so because they were my parents. They felt a sense of obligation to me because of the relationship of parent to child. I'm trying to tell you this relationship with God is absolutely important because you may not experience everything that you want to in terms of your walk with God, but there's some things that God is going to keep on doing because of his obligation that he has made to you. You didn't do everything God wanted you to do yesterday. I didn't do everything God wanted me to do yesterday, but he gave me one more chance and one more opportunity and woke me up this morning. And if he hadn't woke me up this morning, I'd be in his presence right now. So either way, he would have still been my God. So I'm God's child. Not based on demand, but based on desire. And he's made a commitment to me and to you as well. And knowing that he's your God ought to keep you from being fearful. Yeah. Let me share with you this last point. The third reason you do not have to fear is because of God's promise to you. We're going to read verse 10 of Isaiah 41 again. So do not fear for I'm with you. Presence. Do not be dismayed, for I'm your God, relationship. And then finally, I will strengthen you, help you, uphold you. Those are his promises. We do not have to fear because he will strengthen us, he will help us, and he will uphold us. But in order to help you understand what God is saying through Isaiah there, I need to read that same verse from the King James Version. Fear thou not, I'm with thee. Be not, deep, be not dismayed, for I am thy God. And here it is. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Now we need to pay attention to the word yea there, because the word yea in the King James text indicates that every promise gathers up the promise that preceded it. So that it implies while God is doing this, he's also doing this. But while he's doing that, he's also doing that. Can I go back to the text? Can I read it one more time? Be not dismayed. I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea. I will help thee, yea. I will uphold thee 
with the right hand of my righteousness. So there is a cumulative effect in the promises of God in this verse. Every promise, that means that in the verse, he's strengthening us, but then he's helping us, but the help gathers up the strength before the help starts. So the help is gathering up the strength, and then the upholding is gathering up the help and the strength so that God is stacking blessings. One on top of another. All of these three blessings are connected so that they are all happening at the same time, which means that the promise is comprehensive. We were, we were, in, we were in pastor's dining this morning having breakfast. Brother Walker was in there with us. He fixed us pancakes. Well, when I got through having breakfast, Brother Walker sat down to have some breakfast. And he got himself three pancakes. Now, he didn't space them out side by side. He stacked his pancakes, and then he put his topping on them. So that when he cut into them for the first bite, he was enjoying all three. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? He was enjoying all three pancakes at the same time. So God is saying through Isaiah, I will strengthen you, yes. I will help you, yes. I will uphold you. God is saying I'm stacking the blessings so that while you're experiencing my strength, you're also experiencing my help and my upholding at the same time. Stacking the blessings. There's something about having a stacked deck, isn't it? Yeah, when you play cards, when the deck is stacked in your favor, that means you got stuff piled up that prevent you from losing because the stack is in your behalf. And then it's written in this text in the perfect tense, which means that God is saying this blessing is everything you need both now and later. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? It's, it, it's related to everything that is and everything that will be. So specifically, God says, and I'm almost done, I'll strengthen you, I will help you, and I'll uphold you. When he says, I'll strengthen you, he's saying, I'll fortify you. Meaning, since he doesn't have to be renewed, he will renew you. Isaiah says in chapter 40, they that wait on the Lord shall, what, renew their strength. What does that mean? That means that God will refill you before you run out. It's like being in a restaurant and you've got a cup of coffee and your server comes by and sees that you've got just a little bit left. You haven't run out completely, but you've got just a little. And the server will say, can I freshen that for you? Which means that God is saying, those that wait on me get their strength renewed because before you completely run out, God will stop by and say, can I freshen that for you and refill you before you have gone, gone out completely? So he fortifies and renews us. Secondly, it says that he will help us. That has to do with guidance. It has to do with protection. It has everything to do with what we hear in Psalm 23. Uh, uh, he maketh me to lie down beside still waters, and he restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. Helping us has to do with guidance and protection. And finally, he says, I will uphold you, which means that God will give us support especially understanding that there are some places you cannot get to under your own power. A few weeks ago, I was at a funeral of an elderly woman, and the church was packed, and during the middle of the funeral, one of the sisters sitting on one of the pews got sick. Well, she stood up to go out, but it was discovered that she could not walk on her own. 
So one man got on one side and put her left arm around his shoulder. Another fellow on the other side put her right arm around his shoulder, and they walked her out. That is what God means when he says, I'll uphold you. You think you can make it on your own, but I promise to give you the support that you need to make it out. Finally, God says, the strength, the help, and the support I give you comes from my righteous right hand. The right hand in the Bible is the hand of power. It's the hand of success. So if God is giving you his very best, that means that there is no reason to fear. <clears throat> I read years ago that you don't have to fear because of something that takes place or that has taken place in farms and fields across the years. And it is this. The wise bird understands that the scarecrow is both an advertisement and an invitation. And it's not the dumb bird that knows this. The wise bird understands that the scarecrow is an advertisement for all of the good stuff in the field beyond the scarecrow. The wise bird understands that the scarecrow is an invitation to taste and see what is good in the field because there's nothing that the scarecrow can do to prevent the bird from enjoying what's in the field. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today? I'm trying to make a point that whenever you see a scarecrow in your own experience, that's an advertisement that there's something good beyond the scarecrow and you don't have to fear because God uses the scarecrow as an invitation to get a blessing in the field. And he does it with his righteous right hand. The hand is the instrument of action because it's our hand that carries out our thoughts. Our right hand carries out what our minds have conceived, which means that the promise of God is to be active in your life and in my life. And the promise of God relates to times of peace, times of prosperity, and times of persecution. This has been some kind of week we have just come through. It has been particularly dismaying for many of us. But I need you to understand that we live in a world that sin infiltrated many years ago. And because of that, according to Romans 8, creation is groaning, groaning for redemption, groaning for restoration. You have some who wish that God would just make things right. But God gave us choices. He gave us freedom. And it's impossible to have it both ways. And although God gave us choices and we've made many bad ones, he is still our God. And this is still our Father's world. We are still made in the image of God, capable of thinking like God, capable of acting like God. So I've made up my mind. I'm not going to fear. The future does not look bright, but God is still our God. There are things that discourage me about brothers and sisters around me, <clears throat> but God is still our God. I do not have to fear because the psalmist says the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, 
came upon me to eat up my flesh. They stumbled and fell. And so I've decided to walk with the Lord every day and every hour. I've got to made up mind not to be fearful, but to trust in the Lord with all of my heart and lean on my own understanding in all of my ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct my path. Is there anybody here that wants to leave here with a made of mind to trust in the Lord everywhere everywhere you go it's worth it to hold on to the Lord it's worth it let the storm rage let the wind blow if you trust him he may not change the storm but he'll be with you he'll hold look like you're ready to get out of here but listen even if you feel that way can you just take one more moment and let God know we praise him for who he is and for what he has done if you got Jesus you have everything that you need trust him do not doubt he will surely One more time. He's worthy. Hey, yes. He's worthy. I was, when I was a child, there was a terrible storm happening outside our house one day. It was at night and all of us were in our beds. Mom, dad, me, my older sister Marlene, we were all in our beds. But the storm was furious, lightning was flashing, thunder was rolling, winds were blowing, trees were swaying, and I was afraid of the storm as just a four-year-old. I jumped out of my bed, ran down the hallway, and jumped in the bed with my parents, and they let me stay there and didn't send me back to my room. The storm kept on raging, but I went to sleep. Because it wasn't because the storm had stopped. It was because I was now in the presence of my daddy and my mama. They couldn't stop the storm, but they could change my fear. And I'm trying to tell you today, some things may not change. Some things may get worse before they get better. But hold on! The storm may not end right away. But if you got Jesus, enough amen don't be afraid come on and thank God that we have the Lord with us